Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the state gets a temporary waiver in the No Child Left Behind program. And after hearing from opposition to the South Mountain Freeway, tonight we hear from those in support. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Concerns continue over a plume of wastewater from an abandoned mine in Colorado. The mine discharged an estimated 3 million gallons of contaminated water with 500 gallons per minute still being released. That contaminated water is now reportedly being contained and treated in ponds near the mine. The spill began last week after a cleanup crew supervised by the EPA accidentally breached a debris dam that had formed inside the mine. EPA officials say there appears to be no immediate health hazard, though water samples contain numerous heavy metals, including lead and arsenic. The plume is headed toward parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, with the Navajo Nation declaring a state of emergency. The contaminated water could eventually end up in Lake Powell. Arizona is one of seven states to receive a waiver from provisions of the No Child Left Behind Act, a program that requires states to implement educational assessment standards. Here to tell us what all that means is Leah Landrum Taylor, Director of special projects for the Arizona Department of Education. Good to see you again. Thanks oh, for joining nice us. It's nice to be here. Uh, let's Thank define you. terms. What is No Child Left Behind? Well, I want to take a little bit of a historical walk um, with the No Child Left Behind, why that all came about, and quite frankly, it was just to make sure that there were not inequities uh, for children and students and schools so that you could have equality within our educational system. But if we go back just a little bit with our Education and Secondary Act that we have, uh, with what we call our ESEA waiver, in 2011, September 2011, from that act that started back in 1965, when 2011 came around, it was an opportunity to take a look at the various states and the U.S. Department of Education made a decision that it was time for states to not look at them as a one-size-fits-all and to be able to have some flexibility so that states can go forward and be able to make you know, great strides and achievement throughout education. Thus, waivers were granted to certain states? Absolutely. States that, you know, would qualify for them. And in particular, there are certain areas that you have to make sure that you are looking at and measuring when it comes down to qualifying. For example, you have to, you know, look at, for, for instance, Title I, if there are, are schools that qualify for Title I and what those requirements are, you have more of a tendency to have a lean to say that those are schools that need it. But there's so many instances where schools really were having uh, a, like a, a anemic type of uh, a actions going on where their academic performance was low. And this was something that was going on and on and on. So this was a decision to decide what could be done in order to help to close some of those achievement gaps that were going forward. And this is one of the the, the measures to move forward with that. So so we, we get the waiver here and this, would, this grants more time to implement some of these education plans and I guess some of these plans, and I'm going to kind of go through these real quickly here, uh, includes innovation, uh, like, like locally tailored strategy, those sorts of things, um, plans to implement the Common Core, I know that's in there as well, I know the Department of Education is not crazy about that, but as far as just efforts to improve the lowest performing schools, it seems like that was key. And that is the key, strong efforts to improve low-performing low schools. But assessment and accountability is something that was very, very important. And going forward with the, the types of standards, one of the things that the, the, the waiver allows is flexibility, even in the standards that a state will set. So, but as long as those standards are rigorous and they meet the career uh, readiness so that you work with your higher education community to make sure that that is uh, something that going forward. And again, Arizona wanted a waiver, needed a waiver, got the waiver. Mm -hmm. Why? Again, just what you just said, in order to make sure that we're looking at, like for instance, our bottom 5% okay. of our students, of our schools, and how do we go about making sure that we are setting forth with measurable assessments, measurable standards so that those children can also have that opportunity at an excellent education and to be able to, you know, compete overall. 
you, can't, you couldn't just continue going the same direction and having these children that were just falling off a, off right. a cliff. We had to make sure that we set those standards. So if you, you look at how you even label the schools and how you identify them, that's really important as well. How you even go about identifying those schools that are suffering and then setting forth a plan of how those various districts or schools or, or charter schools as well will, will, will decide, okay, this is the direction that they're gonna go. Now this was, this is a one year extension, correct? Yes. And this is extension from a previous waiver? Right, we had a waiver before. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, as far as like family engagement uh, and those sorts of, is that addressed at all in this situation? I mean, outside of assessment, I know assessment is a big deal here in raising those lower, but families, uh, cultural aspects of all this, are they included? Right, and I think that's a really good point because that is something that as we were putting together even the new waiver, we looked at the different communities that have been known for, for years and years of having high levels of disparity. So if you look, for instance, at some of the tribal communities and what's going on on the reservations, these are the things that are included within the waiver to make sure that we could, again, identify those schools that really are in need of having that plan set forward. How do the administrators, how do the principals go about working in a way to where they can work with the communities, including the communities, and then setting that plan specific for that school and for the population that they serve. Because every, every, every population and every school and every community is different because right. you have a, a certain culture within that, sure. co that community. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't there concerns as well regarding uh, continuing civil rights uh, concerns? I mean, w was that a factor in there as well? There, there, there clearly have been concerns throughout the years, and, and that goes back to your initial question of what the waiver is all about. Right. And that's to make sure that, again, the schools that have been consistently looked at as having low academic achievement and making sure that we are going forward and closing those gaps of inequities. And that is something that when you look at various schools, it, many times at schools, again, that have that, that qualify, that can qualify for the Title I right. funding. And a lot of times, what, how you even measure those Title I funding are those that qualify for free and reduced lunch. English language learning, big Absolutely. factor here. Yeah, another, another factor that right. we have to look at to make sure we, again, are servicing every child. Now, are, are the feds hinting that another waiver could happen as long as the trajectory continues as there, it is? There are conversations going on. There are conversations happening in Congress and movement going in that direction. And, and quite frankly, un, until we can move to catch up, we'll, we'll just see what's gonna happen. And I know at the end of our letter, that was one of the, th the lines that was in the letter once we realized we were going to be receiving this waiver was that they, it would be examined, and if it's something that would be needed to continue, then we could cross that road when we get there. Who is involved, uh, more so than others, in implementing, coming up with these ideas, implementing these strategies? Well, it's, it, it's a combination. Uh, the way this evolved and came about was with the U.S. Department of Education. When they did make the decision that every state is not the same, every school is not the same, every district is not the same, what can we do to allow that flexibility so that if there is a school, a district that is falling behind, how can they come up with innovative ways? Because innovation is also really important, but again, you have to have the assessment, you have to have those tools to make sure that you're doing the proper measurement and you are going forward with, with moving about. But it came about from conversations that across this country of what could be done. As far as Arizona though, who were involved in those conversations? Well, here the decision ultimately is with our superintendent of public instruction. And that was a decision that was made coming forward. It had already been moving along. We already had the waiver. Mm -hmm. And when Superintendent Douglas was sworn in and brought in as the new superintendent, the decision was made to go ahead and continue forward with this. So, um, we're talking about the future now of Arizona education by way of No Child Left Behind. What is the future of No Child Left Behind? Well, I, I, I think that's a really good question. And I think we go back to what, again, what is it all about? And it's about making sure that each child will have what they need 
in order to have an excellent education. And then taking a look, you know, at our standards, making sure we do have the rigorous standards going forward, and then a transition plan, even for those schools, once they have moved forward and they're starting to achieve, you have to have a strong transition plan to mm -hmm. be able to go forward and monitor and making sure that they are moving in the direction that they need to go. But so what happens with that, with the No Child Left Behind? We hope that we don't leave any children behind. And there are certainly significant things that our, our superintendent um, of our public instruction, Diane Douglas, she's really working hard to, to, to achieve and to move in that direction where every child will matter, every child will count, and to make sure that their educational needs are met. And that's critical. Well, it's, it's for, in terms of quantifying results, I know it's, it's still relatively recent and everyone's got a different uh, aspect here, but it's nice to know the feds are looking at what's being talked about and what's being planned and implemented and saying, okay, that makes sense to us. Let's move it forward. Good Absolutely. to have you here. Thank, Thank you so you much so for joining much. us. Welcome. Last week we heard from an opponent of the South Mountain Freeway in Phoenix. Tonight we hear from a supporter of the proposed freeway. David Martin is president of the Arizona Chapter of Associated General Contractors of America. Good to see you. Thanks for joining well, us. Well, thank you very much for having us. We uh, appreciate the you opportunity. Bet you. We wanted to get the other side here now, so let's get going. Why is this freeway good for the region? Well, first and foremost, we need to give a little history lesson here and talk about uh, exactly what, what the South Mountain has gone through, essentially. 1985, the voters voted in the affirmative to, uh, to put a freeway plan together that included the South Mountain, A. B, uh, in 2004, once again, under Prop 400, the voters again approved the transportation plan, which included the South Mountain. I uh, did a little bit of research uh, on that vote and uh, want to let you know that we carried every single precinct in Ahwatukee. Um, Furthermore, uh, we went a little bit further because since we were advocating for um, the 202 during the EIS process, um, we did some additional polling. So we asked the voters specifically about the South Mountain, Maricopa County voters, okay, specifically about the South Mountain, and 64% of the voters in Maricopa County supported the South Mountain. So I, I need to keep going because this is really important because sure. we keep drilling down. On, on the issue of Levine and, and Ahwatukee. We asked Levine and Ahwatukee residents, what do you think about the South Mountain? We got a 59% approval rating. Then we said let's drill even down further to Ahwatukee. And Ahwatukee was still over 50% of the voters supporting the South Mountain. 
So we've got people supporting the South Mountain Freeway. But again, why is it good for the region? Do they know what they're supporting? Well, of course they know what they're supporting. They knew they were putting together a regional plan that would connect the West Valley with the East Valley. They knew that. Um, the campaign literature was clear that we were delivering a comprehensive transportation plan which included freeways and, and light rail and arterial streets in Prop 400. So, uh, but I, I know that those who are for the freeway say that it's, it's a good way to get that through traffic around the Central Corridor area and allow for trucks and, and people on their way to LA or on their way out of LA uh, to bypass much of Central Phoenix and thus ease congestion. Critics, we had them on last week, right. say the studies show it's not going to ease congestion. The, well, I think, I, I think your, uh, uh, Mr. Brittle talked about the issue of cooking the books and I would say that he's cooking the books. Um, he mentioned the issue of two minutes, a billion dollars, he mentioned that issue. But what he didn't mention uh, was the fact that that same study said it could shave as much as two minutes off the commute to 25 minutes off the commute, okay? So pulling slivers of the information and presenting that is a little bit disingenuous. With that said, though, he also didn't tell you that we're not talking about one car. We're talking about 117,000 cars daily, minimum, 190,000 cars maximum. So I'm giving you a range, two minutes to 25 minutes, 117,000 vehicles, 190,000 vehicles. That's what we're talking about here. So you're saying less congestion. I'm saying less congestion, absolutely. He's saying worst air already, some of the worst air already in the United States is in that area, and he their health experts say that the freeway will cause for even worse pollution. A absolutely, 100% false. And let me explain why. Um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, which Maricopa Association of Governments handles, hand, uh, doing the air quality plan, and carbon monoxide right now, the, the limit for carbon monoxide in the health standards is nine parts per million, okay? Uh, right now, we are doing a phenomenal job on controlling uh, our air quality. We are 67% below the national standard of nine parts per million. So it's just nonsense. That doesn't add up. He says, though, that uh, they have health experts, and they're saying that the increased pollution or the pollution as it is that will not get any better because of the freeway going through the, the area will cause for uh, kids on both sides of the mountain, stunted lungs, uh, premature death in older folks, and that every time they bring this stuff up with, they say, uh, you know, valued health experts, there's never a response. Well, I'll give you the response, and I will tell you that we are under um, scrutiny by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we are required to hand, hand in state implementation plans. So the, it just doesn't add up. The actual organization, the EPA, um, that dictates whether or not we're in conformance or not has said, in fact, that we're, we're in conformity. It, was the EPA using recent numbers? Because, again, critics are saying that 2005 data, especially census data, mm -hmm. 2005 data was used as opposed to more recent 2010 data. Well, um, I think the data in the Maricopa County proves that we are in, a, in great shape from an air quality perspective. We have 22 monitors. Uh, that are cast throughout the valley, valley. many of them are, uh, are adjacent to freeways. And like I said, on the carbon monoxide front, we're 67% below the health standard. That's pretty good, and that's evidence. That's not conjecture, that's not hyperbole. Uh, the, the Gila River Indian Tribe, uh, mm -hmm. the community, uh, they have filed suit now, and they say that the state and the feds did not adequately consider, adequately consider uh, the impact to the tribes. How do you respond to that? Well, what I would say is um, I have a great deal of faith in the professional, professionalism of the Arizona Department of Transportation and the Maricopa Association of Governments and FHWA. Um, I can't address that. That's water under the bridge as far as, as far as the record of decision is concerned. That now is in the courts, and they're going to have to determine that, on, on, and we would, uh, we'd welcome a solution to that that issue. I think everything we've talked about, again, you talked about cooking the books and that, that mm -hmm. phrase was used by critics right. of the freeway. Mm -hmm. uh, they say go back to the drawing board. It wasn't an honest process. It was a bunch of folks who wanted a freeway making sure that the numbers and all the data, even if you had to go to old data, proved that you needed the freeway. Again, how do you respond? Well, well, I respond by 30 years of voter approval. That's how I respond. It wasn't, it wasn't knee-jerk. It was created in 1985. It was affirmed in 2004. It was passed by uh, the voters in Ahwatukee. Absolutely not. They didn't do anything that any responsible planning uh, organization wouldn't do. So they're wrong when they say that the freeway was always wanted and thus the process justified the freeway. The voters wanted it. It's really important to clarify. The voters wanted it. Um, 
As far as options and alternatives, mm -hmm. I keep hearing more buses, I keep hearing more transit, mm -hmm. I'm hearing a different route even for the freeway. Are those viable alternatives? Well, what's great about our transportation system is it's layered, right? You have the state responsible for certain things, you have regional Maricopa Association involved with certain things, and you have the city involved in sort of the more uh, localized programs. So um, the voters, August 25th, will have an opportunity to faci help facilitate that additional congestion by voting yes on Proposition 104 in Phoenix, which brings additional light rail, additional buses, additional service to Ahwatukee and uh, all, all the rest of the valley. But for those who say that kind of system could also work in terms of relieving congestion, I-10 congestion, you say? I say the fact of the matter is that we have a regional transportation plan that uh, the South Mountain was a vital component of that makes the system work. Whatever happened to that super freeway idea where the regional traffic around the Broadway curve would be able to go all along this, like nine or 12 or 15, right, know, who knows right. how many lanes? What happened to that idea? Um, that is, they're doing a spine study, the MAG is right now, and they're, looking, they're still investigating that as a possibility. But this, it's not an either or issue, as far as I'm concerned, it's both. Both need to be done, the South Mountain and the, um, and the widening. And as far as the tribe, again, the tribe's concerns, you're, are, are you just saying that these were already addressed by others? What's, I think a lot of people are concerned that they say the South Mountain is sacred to mm -hmm. the tribe, and they don't like the idea of, of, of dynamite and bulldozing. The, the process to get to a record of decision is very, very rigorous, okay? The Department of Transportation was extremely liberal in their outreach, okay? They had one meeting where they actually bused people to the meeting. They had six more meetings prior to that, regional meetings, where they received input. Over 8,000 folks responded. 78% of the folks that responded in the affirmative. All right. It. We'll stop you right there. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for you. joining Thank us. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.